Hey gang, back again. Hey, took a little break, helped a friend, helping the people. And now we are resuming our quest for the perfect song. All right. Um, I went over in a previous um, live stream. Uh, by the way, this is Creative Ed's channel, and this is we're doing songwriting. Uh, I'm Rick Beresford, and uh, if you want to give, you know, several thousand dollars of your vast wealth that we all have from working in the Navy and Army and Marines and Air Force and Coast Guard and Homeland Security. Yeah. And Gruen's Guitars. If you all want to send us some money, we would like that because that's how we keep this show on the road. All right? All right, now, I have started... What we normally do on this show is we analyze hit songs and talk about why they're hits. But but here's the deal. I realized a little ways into this adventure that I should teach some basics that you can go back to and refer to uh, because these are all, uh, all these web things are going to be on YouTube, right? So... Um, so I've started that process. So for the next couple of uh, sessions, we're going to go through the basics. We could call it Wiki Songwriter, right? Uh, which I'm starting a, uh, a website called wikisongwriter.com. And it's going to be when you go to that site, it's not up yet, but when you do go to it, it'll just be the workings of a song. Uh, I'm going to use the analogy... Um, the analogy I'm using is four-wheeled vehicles, all right? That includes cars, vans, pickups, SUVs, you know, uh, and all the way up to 18-wheelers, right? So wheeled tr transportation. I'm going to use that. So if you were to build a car or a vehicle to get from A to B, how would you build it? I'm going to show you all the pieces and parts of this vehicle called songwriting, right? So when you go to this website, uh, wikisongwriter.com, you'll be able to see all the pieces and parts. So when you're stuck in a particular part of a song, you can go to this as kind of a table of contents of what songs are, uh, you can go to it as a manual. How about that? A manual, a songwriter's manual, right? Like you would go to a rhyming dictionary. This is going to a songwriting dictionary. So you can look up stuff and go, oh, I haven't thought about doing time, the time element. I haven't thought about that because that will be in the as, as part of the pieces and parts, right? Because we're all looking to make our vehicle the best it can be right we want to have the air conditioning we want the plush leather seats we want you know the uh, the internet and the backup camera and you know blah bling bling bluetooth right and uh quiet tires and killer boss stereo right so we want all this stuff and so we're going to teach you how to build what what uh, elements are in the Cadillac, the Rolls Royce of songs, right? And there's all kinds of songs. That's the, that's why I like to use this uh, vehicle. There are like, you know, high end pickups that cost sixty thousand dollars. There are high end sports cars. There are high end, um, you know, luxury cars. There's high end everything, right? And that's what we are. Well, that's why we're on this website right now is because you want to build the Rolls Royce of songwriting. And in order to do that, you need to 
knows all the ways, all the pieces and the parts and how to put them together, right? So I've already done, in t I think I had two previous ones of basics. We had the creative process was number one. Number two was, re was um, writer's block, okay? And so that covered the, the basics of the creative process, right? So now, starting today, we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of the actual song, right? We also gave you in previous, um, in, what, in those two um, previous ones, we gave you some writer's exercises. So if you haven't, if you want some good writing exercises, go back and listen to those previous uh, ones and you will see some really cool, some really nice um, uh, writing exercises to get your creativity going because we always want you to be running on, you know, high test fuel, right? We're going to get our vehicle going. We want to make sure that everything's made of the, you know, the high. we want the fuel to be the best, you know, 90, 92% octane, right? It's just the highest octane you can buy, 93. So that's what we're doing. Um, that's what we did with the creative process. Now, to move on to um, the basics, first of all, let's just talk about all the components of a song. There are 10 components to a song, okay? And with these 10 components, we can manipulate them in many different ways, right? So the 10 components are, first of all, what? I mean, the title, the concept, right? The idea, the title, the concept. What is the imagined thing we're going to say? What's the emotional message that we're going to give to our listeners and to myself? Let's not exclude ourselves because when we write songs, it makes us feel good, right? And that's one of the reasons why I'm here teaching you vets is to help you feel better, to transfer your warrior mentality into your creative mentality and cathartically get your juju out, right? Get all those, you know, all the pains and fears and doubts and worries that you had about your experience, if you had that kind of experience. Some, some of you may not have, but... Um, there are some of us that have had very traumatic experiences. I was in the Vietnamese War on an aircraft carrier, uh, and although I didn't see combat, I launched five missions a day. We lost five um, aircraft. We lost five airmen uh, during my mission, and, uh, and I could see the fire at night in the jungle from the aircraft carrier, we could see the shoreline. We were that close to the shore in the Gulf of Tonkin. And we could see, and occasionally actually even hear, the, um, the battles going on. And we could see the, uh, the, the, the fires blazing. So it was, it, was a, it, was, it was for real. It was for real. Uh, anyway, okay, so we've got 10 things. Uh, the ten things are, the first thing is the concept, right? Obviously, we, we have a concept. I will say that you don't need a concept to start writing a song. All that you need is... Just a little rhythm, maybe? Or you just need like a chord progression, maybe? My trusty gibbo which I love so much. It's my cutaway Gibson studio model. It's got a sm smaller uh, back here, so it doesn't boom quite as much as the, as the original J45. This is, it sounds pretty good. All right, I'm gonna put my three string capo on it because I just love the three string capo. It's just a fun thing to have. Now my guitar is terribly out of tune, and that's a shame.
boy. That's one thing about having a real wooden guitar. They go out of tune because they're wiggly, made out of real life stuff. I have a guitar that's made out of coal. It's actually carbon fiber, made by Rainsong. Fantastic guitar, love it. I use it on the road. It never goes out of tune. But I just like the sound of wood, right? Sometimes wood sounds good. Wood sounds good. So uh, a concept can be, you know. Early one morning when the sun was rising high. I don't know where that's going, but you see what I mean? You can just you can start with a melody, you can start with chords. Uh, you can start with anything, but eventually, eventually you run into a concept, right? That's uh, what we're talking about here is writing forward or writing backward, right? When we write backward, we start with a concept. Here's the concept. And then we're going to go, what's the first verse? What's the pre-chorus? What's the chorus? What's the, you know, we're, we're going to go through that, right? But um, when... You can start just like I said with a rhythm, with an opening line, with uh, uh, with a chord pattern, literally with anything. You can start with, and that's writing forward. So writing forward, you start with an opening line and a couple of chords or something, and then you just go and see where it takes you. I know a lot of uh, very successful, monetarily successful songwriters hit songwriters that that actually write that way that often they just start with an opening line something that just feels like oh yeah that's that, that that'll lead somewhere you know that'll lead somewhere anyway so the concept that's the first thing second thing is the genre the second piece of the puzzle the second element of songwriting is genre genre cannot be overlooked, people of America. Cannot be overlooked, right? Because um, when you're writing a hit song, you're going to aim it towards a particular audience. Unless you're writing, you know, like a big anthem song, which would, you know, encompass the whole English-speaking language, which there are those songs. David Foster knows them well. Right, that's what he does. He writes, he writes and produces songs that don't have a genre. They're just big, big, powerful songs. Right, but uh, but most songs are aimed at a country audience, a hip hop, rap audience, um, an R and B, pop, bluegrass, reggae. Irish jig, on and on and on and on, right? Lithuanian nose flute must not forget that most important genre. So, in order to have a successful song monetarily, and just even that people are going to listen to, let's say you're going to write a country song, you have to know what I'm going to call country ease, like Japanese, like Chinese, like Portuguese, right? We're going to have to write in country ease. Hey, Nina, how you doing, girl? Good to have you aboard. Um, so you need, to, you need to know the genre. So if you come from the South like me, I'm from the South Boston. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, how do I speak like a southern boy? How do I speak like a boy from Alabama? Well, I just listen to all of them country songs. And I learn how to do it. See what I mean? You have to go and listen to the genre that you want to write. Unless, of course, you grew up. I mean, if you grew up in Alabama, then you're going to write. You're going to write a country song, okay? You're going to write a country song, people. But if you grew up in Boston... You know, you kind of have to learn language. 
you know, bless your heart. Now, they do not say that in Boston. See what I mean? So you got to learn your genre. Same thing with hip hop. You got to learn how the hip hop language is spoken. Uh, or you're just not going to get those people interested in your song. I mean, you can rap all you want, but they're just going to go, that sounds like Katy Perry doing a rap song. You know, it's just like, ah, it's not working, right? So learn your genre, unless you're already in it, and then enjoy your genre. You know, I come from Boston, so folk music, folk pop music is very, very embedded in me, like James Taylor, Joni Mitchell, um, uh, Bruce Springsteen, uh, you know, those kind of people, they're, they're just embedded in my soul, right? They're, and Bob Dylan, they're just, they're part of who I am, right? Because I grew up with that style of songs, you know, just going through my head and loving. Okay, so genre is the second element of songwriting. Third element is and we're going to get very deep into this one, is called the lyric elements. And the lyric elements consist of physical writing, the real world, emotional writing, your feelings, symbolic writing, which is symbols, figurative language, and the last is conclusive writing. When you draw a conclusion from your real life and the feelings that you got from that real life, you draw conclusions and it's fun it's fun to get on your soapbox and sometimes you know say hey love stinks you know that's a conclusion that you might say after you've broken up with the one and only lover that you thought was the one so you would say love stinks you know here you are. conclusive writing right so we're going to get into all that very deeply in in a minute in just a little minute the next thing is obviously we're building a car, right? We're building our car. We need a frame. We need a frame. Am I right? You know I'm right. I'm always right. So we need a frame to put the car on, right? So that's your form. And basically, it's chorus and non-chorus songs. That's the basics of the form. The next thing we have is lyric development. So is this going to be a you know, like, is it going to have two seats? Is it going to seat two people? going to seat four or five? You start to put, you know, the interior together. What's it going to look like? What kind of steering wheel and all that? So this is the development. We have an idea. We have a concept. And now how are we going to develop this? And uh, we'll talk about all the, 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 the many. Basically, there's five ways to do it. Um, you know, like telling a story or or expressing your emotions is, is sort of the basic of it, right? We can go either way. Um, uh, okay, and then the next thing is, now here's what, you notice we've talked all about lyrics now, right? So up to the uh, number five, which is lyric development, that's all been about lyric. Now, we're getting into the transition between words and the music. The transitional two um, elements are rhyme, which is number six, and rhythm, which is number seven, right? And rhyme and rhythm, they dance together, don't they? They work together. So they're really almost one thing. But we're going to talk separately about them, and you'll see why when we get to that place. People, be patient. Patience. We're going to get to it. Okay. Now, now we've transitioned from rhyme and rhythm into melody, right? Because melody has a rhythm to it. Ba ba da ba, da 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 da, ba da 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 da. That melody has a line rhythm. Ba ta ta ta, ta 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 ta, ta 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 ta, pa ba da pa. And that line rhythm also determines what kind of rhyme scheme that we want to hear with that, right? And we're going to talk all about that. We're not going to miss a thing. We're going to talk all about how that works, right? And so we got melody is number eight. Number nine is chords. 
or harmonies, right, to the melody, chords. And number 10 is an overlooked situation, which is, wait for it, texture. Is that really important? Yes, it is very important. Texture is extremely important. So in the verse, we can have a texture of, you know, and then, and we can have a texture, a different texture. strumming hard and then just finger picking in the in the verse that's just that's just a texture of one instrument but we can have banjo in the verse and have mandolin in the chorus or we can have real clean uh, electric guitar in the verses and have just crunch guitar you know in the in the choruses and so forth brushes versus sticks half time versus full time these are all textures and textures in the in the variety and the variance of textures helps move your song to where we want it to be. We never want a song to f fall. Like we talked about the arc of, you know, we, when, when, uh, when we talk about writing literature, whether it be a novel or a screenplay or whatever, we talk about the arc of the story. You've heard that many times where it, the story goes up, 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 and it keeps its interest, and then it has just maybe a little wrap up at the end where it turns. Well, with songs, we have so much more than just lyric. We have line rhythm, we have rhyme, we have melodies and chords and textures that are not in a novel or in a screenplay or in a poem, right? So I call it, I call it the, um, the arc of interest. Right? So we always want to keep the arc of interest rising, rising, rising. Right? And we'll talk about the arc of interest a lot when we, when we uh, well, all through this procedure, this thing that we do here together. We are always talking about the arc of interest. So we always want to keep our interest levels rising, rising, rising. We never want it to level off. Right? by being redundant or repeating too much or there's all kinds of mistakes that people make that cause the song to be um, lose interest right we want the listener to keep interested all the way to this what we call the powerful closure we want that closure way up here on the top right so uh, the arc of interest is very important right and texture is one of those little tricks that helps us keep that arc of interest rising. So when things get dull, you can simply change the texture. Simply change the texture. That one bit of change can make all the difference. You come to learn that in the songwriting process, it's often the little things that make a huge difference. And this took a while for me to learn, but rewriting something doesn't necessarily mean tearing the whole thing apart. It can literally mean changing one word or taking one word out of a line or changing one note. Literally, one note can sometimes make a monstrous difference in how that arc keeps rising and rising and rising, right? Don't ask me why. I don't. It's just the way it is. Little things can make a huge difference in uh, in the songwriting world, in the world of wikisongwriter.com. Okay, so those are those are the ten songwriting elements. Now we're going to start breaking them down. But first, let us talk about the tools that we have to manipulate these ten elements. So we have tools to manipulate, right? Okay, let's talk about those. Now, uh, first of all, of course, 
in the last two episodes, we talked about the creative process. So we're just going to say on top that one of the, the basic, basic, basic tool, which I don't even count because it's because it's more of a mystery, and that is your spark, your creative, your lightning, your creative process in the moment, right? I mean, that's the biggest tool you got. But as far as physical tools, you have three physical tools. That's not very many, but these th these three tools, this is the magic triad, the magic triad of success in completing a song that really satisfies the listener from beginning from the beginning all the way to the end oh all right so these three tools are original detail which means the details of your life something real that you relate to people magnate towards the truth they love the truth and when you come from a tr place here right here in your heart when you come from your heart people know it when you start making shit up you got to be really good professionals can make shit up they can make it up but amateurs you know you should always start from what you feel in your heart what you know in your real life right take take experiences that you've personally experienced or that your parents experienced or friends or you could take an experience from a movie you saw or a book you read or a poem or a play you can take experiences from all these things from your real life right that is and when I say original details, let me say, Charles John Quarto told me once, originality is nothing more than a series of tiny surprises, all right? So when I say original lyric, I don't mean, you don't have to go wacky crazy about this. You can just, like, it's like you want to put, you're building your car, you want to put a little pinstripe on the side, right? That's just that amount of originality sometimes can be all you need depending on the style of song if the song if the song is story based you want a lot more original detail because you're telling a story you don't want to use generic terms when you're telling a story otherwise you're going to lose interest but if you're writing an emotional song just smatterings just little bits and we'll you'll see what I'm talking about later we got so much to cover. But uh, so the first tool you have is your original lyrics, your original details of your life. All right. The second one is contrast. Things that are different from each other. So contrast can simply be da 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 ba da 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 ba da 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 ah notice that mmm is so different than da 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 right contrast also um you can contrast all the ten elements except well it's a little tricky to do genre and it's very and it's kind of tricky to con to to contrast the concept although there have been very successful songs that said, for instance, you can trust me, uh, uh, you know, I will always love you, I will always be this, I will always be this, I will always be this. And then the contrasting thing would be, I would never do this, you see? So even in your concept, you can have contrast. You can have, and part of, obviously, what you just learned was, part of contrast is opposites, right? Opposites are one of the most obvious forms of contrast, right? So um, contrast is really keeps helps keep interest. Original details, little bits of lyric and and that ha that haven't been heard before. Contrast in your melody, contrast in your chords, contrast 
in your in your uh, textures, contrast in, in your in your rhyme scheme, in your line rhythm. Contrast also helps keep interest because the minute you change something, people notice. They go, "Oh, that's different." See, "Oh, that's oh, that's different." Get it? That "o" oh is we're staying, we're keeping it going up, aren't we? So anytime we start to get bored, throw in a little contrast, possibly. Okay, right? Again, the whole thing is very mysterious. So it's a question of you feel like you need to have something in there. So if it feels like, let's throw in some contrast, you do it, right? The third one is, 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 repetition, 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 repetition. It's the opposite of contrast, isn't it? Repeating something. So those are your three tools. You can repeat your verses, your verse line rhythm. You can repeat the way you sing the chorus. You can repeat um, a melody phrase. You can repeat a texture. You can repeat characters' names. You can repeat important words in the song. If the song's about home, you can say home a bunch of times because that's what the song's about. Okay, so that's your three tools. Original detail from your life. Remember that you're unique. Everyone in this listening to this, everyone, you're all unique. You all have a different take on life than anyone else. You want to use that. Don't be afraid to use what you are. Don't be afraid to do that, okay? Very important. Number two, contrast in all those ten, ten elements. And number three is repetition. We do we hear about a lot we hear a lot about repetition in songwriting, don't we? We manipulate those three things in a magical, creative in the moment way. We never know from one minute to the next what's going to happen, right? Every time we sit down to write a song, it's a new creative experience, right? So good to know, isn't it? Okay. Now, moving along, we've got those three basic tools. Now let's just let's start from the let's start from the uh, from the very beginning. Let's start from let's talk about titles. What's in a title? Is it important? Are titles important? Well, yes and no. Okay? So, if you have a title like, I've got friends in low places, which is a which is a play on words, and I've got friends in high places, and then he said, I've got friends in low places. And that title is sitting on the desk of an A&R guy at a record label. That kind of a title could get the attention of the dude, of the girl, of the gal, of the mister, of the missus, of the miss. Okay? It could get their attention. But what if the song sucks? See what I mean? I mean, you got a great title, the song sucks. So you can have a boring title like, like, um, Our House. Crosby, Stills, and Nash wrote a song. Our house is a very, very, very fine house. Two kids in the... You know what I mean? That's a beautiful song. Super boring title. Ugh. Our house, really? Yes, really, because it was a great song. So titles can help you a little bit to get some attention, but it ain't the end of the world. If you have a if you have a title that's kind of generic, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not going to be a great song. It could be a really great song, right? I could literally have a song called "My Love for You." Oh, boring is that. I mean, that's so generic and sophomoric. 
right? It's even freshmanic, right? So it's so boring. But it could be the best hit song that I ever had, right? So you just don't know. So titles, titles can be uh, what we want to call independent titles, titles that kind of like stand alone, like I've got friends in low places is a very clever title. And that, that, that's, a, that's a, an independent title. It doesn't need anything else. It's just a great title uh, on somebody's desk. And then there's dependent titles, titles that need a great song to get to that title. Like Our House is a boring title, but if the A&R guy picked it up, girl picked it up, hey, they play the song and they go, wow, that's a great song. Hey, hey, Larry, I found this great song. It's called Our House. I know, I know. Boring title, but listen to it. Here. Open your door. I've got it. I'll play it on the speakers. Go, oh, yeah, wow, that's a great song. See what I mean? So, titles. Um, song basics. Let's talk about, well, we did talk about it, but let's talk about, there's two ways to drive a song lyrically. You can drive it with a story or you can drive it with an emotion. And either one of those things can be symbolic. So I can have a symbolic story like I'm going to the Big Apple. I'm going to take a bite out of the Big Apple and that's going to be a story song about me going to New York, right? Or you can have a symbolic emotional song, you know? Um, the rock, the rock bottom of your heart, the hard rock bottom of your heart, hard rock bottom, you know, or it can be, you know, like, uh, butterfly kisses, right? These are all symbols, right? I want to be your sledgehammer, right? Dust in the wind. All these things are symbolic, right? Uh, and they're, uh, those are all emotional or conceptual songs, right? They're not songs with a story, necessarily. But you get my drift, okay? Um, there's only two ways that a song can go for, you know, uh, and create interest. You can go forward with your story, with your physical writing, or you can go with deep emotions. And emotions can either be happy or they can be sad right it's this it's the theater the masks of the happy mask and the sad mask right from when you see the theater mask so the reason for that is there's only two ways a, st a song can go and you can either you can either be happy or sad you know it can be fantastic or angry you know it can be super loving or jealous loving you know happy or sad basically right there's only two ways to go so you can go forward with details and keep it interesting or you can also go deep with emotions so the depth of emotions and the interest and the details of a story combine to keep your to keep momentum moving keeping that line going up 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 right all the way Bump, you bump the top. Oh, it was that good. Now we're going to keep the fish here. We're going to eat the fish in the mouth. Ah, he bit my finger. So, those are the, that, that's, there's that. All right? So, uh, the way you can tell a story. Uh, let's talk about prosody. That's a basic word in songwriting. Prosody means the emotional marriage of a lyric to its melody or music, right? So when you have a sad lyric, it's good to have a sad melody to match it, right? So that's called good prosody, when those two things come together, when the emotion of the lyric meets the emotion of the music. That's good prosody. Now, there's also such thing as what I call forced prosody. That's when the songwriters purposely take a, for instance, it could go both ways, but you take a 
sad lyric and you put it to a happy or upbeat melody and you put that together and what you find is the irony of gee this lyric is so sad but the melody's happy that's so ironic what i wonder why that means what you so you're trying to hold something in right the irony of that fact is is what can sometimes be part of the interest of the song is that irony it can be part of the interest um i don't know if you've heard about a, a, a little place called motown Listen to, listen to the um, um, what are they called? The um, the, the the three gals. Uh, I forgot their names. Isn't that terrible? But they go, baby, baby, where does our love go? Deep inside me, and it hurt me so bad. Hurts so bad. You know what I mean? It's it's, it's so it's it's a it's a Diana Ross and the Supremes. Ha <laughs> ha! I got it. Um, Motown learned. They said, "Look, kids, when a, you know teenagers are already so full of angst, right? So full of angst that they don't need sad lyrics and sad music most of the time." What is going to make them happy is a sad lyric, but put it with a danceable melody and keep it a little bit upbeat. And they'll get the message and they'll get the irony of the fact that this is upbeat and I'm dancing, but I hear the sadness also. So it helps kind of defuse the teen angst, sadness, fear, everybody's looking at me thing that teenagers go through, right? And all that testosterone and, uh, and estrogen just surging through their bodies, right? They don't know what the heck to do with all that, right? Crazy. So they learned that. Motown was very smart when they, when they figured that out. Uh, they said, yeah, let's write sad lyrics with happy melodies and music and boom. Tracks of My Tears. Take a good look at my face. If my smile seems out of place, I mean that's pretty darn happy. If you do have a, take the take the take the uh, the words out, and you've got a really happy song, you know. But then you listen to the words, you go, Ooh, wait a minute, that's that's kind of sad. Mm. And so that's what I call forced prosody at its best, right? Sometimes forced prosody doesn't work, so you got to be careful when you purposely. Uh, and you can go the other way also. You can have a super sad melody with a very happy lyric. And the audience will immediately get the irony, again the irony, of, wow, this person is trying to be happy, trying to tell us how happy things are, but listen to that music. That music is so sad. So what's the lesson here? And this will be a lesson that we talk about over and over and over. Music always, listen to me, 100% music always dominates the emotion over words, over lyric. Always, always, always. There's no way you can make a happy song if the music is sad. There is just no way you can do that. So I, you know, I could say like, It's happy hour. Look at all those happy faces. Yeah, I'm here again. Just drinking and having fun. No, no, we're not having fun. You get the irony right away that this person wants so badly to be happy, but they're not happy, right? So music always dominates, always dominates over 
words. So just keep that in mind, right? So, and you know, doing forced prosody is tricky. So if you want to try it, great, but just make sure that people, you write it in a way that people pick up the irony of it, right? Okay, so that's, prosody is an important uh, uh, word. All right, now, when we talk about song ideas, we want, a, you know, if you want um, a song that's going to be successful monetarily, we've talked about how successful songwriters and successful money sometimes, you know, sometimes they have a, you know, you're trying to try and, trying, oh, and sometimes every now and again they, oh, they come together. Sometimes successful money meets successful songwriting. But that doesn't mean you haven't written a successful song. Just because it ain't making money does not mean it's, it's not a great song. Always keep that in mind. You'll know it's a great song when you get it critiqued by a professional such as moi. Oh, yeah. I critique songs on the side. That's one of the things I do. So if you get if you get somebody, a professional to go, hey man, that is a great song. You've got a great song. That's a successful, wonderful song. Okay. Will it make money? That's a whole other story that we may get into way down the line. Okay. But that's a long ways away. Okay. But we do want to write a successful song. So that's what we're talking about. So successful song ideas are always a combination of an old emotion, an old established emotion that everyone understands, and a new approach to that old-fashioned emotion. So we have an old-fashioned emotion with a new approach. All songs have that those two things going for them right so they have a unique way of expressing a very relatable and very universal emotion all songs are about emotions all songs all all songs otherwise we don't have this if songs not emotional if it's not touching you in some way it's not going to go up it's just going to go here and then just going to level off maybe even drop if you don't get some emotion if you don't get the juices flowing in your listeners' emotional bloodstream, you're not getting your songs. Yeah. But I know you're here because you want to have that. You want to get that. You want to get it right. You want to build that vehicle, whether it be a car, or pickup, or whatever. You want to build it to where it's you're proud of it and it shines, right? Yeah. It may not get into the auto show, but you've polished it and you put it together and it and you get in that car and and you and the few people that know about that car, they get in and they ride and they just they're so enjoying it. So many people are enjoying it. You could get the song in a car show and then a million people enjoy it, right? So that's that's another trick. So um, song ideas always have those two things. Song ideas also are singable. That's important because um, the average male voice is only one octave plus maybe two or three notes. I mean, really, that's the average male doesn't have that big of a range. You would think you would have more. You would, the average person say, oh, yeah, two, two and a half octaves. No. Women have a tendency to have more of an octave range. They can have an, oct an octave, that's eight notes, including, you know, the same note, one and the eight are the same note, and four or five notes above and or below that octave, right? And some, and some rare singers, both male and female, can have two octave ranges, can have two and a half, even three octave ranges, you know? And my girlfriend, Ariana Grande, oh, you didn't know, no. We, we are just so tight. We're, 
were very, very, very tiny. Yeah. In my wildest dreams, uh, get in line, huh? Anyway, Ariana, you have a range of about 23 octaves, I think it was last counted, maybe. And Celine Dion, I mean, there's some people that are famous for their octave range, right? Yeah, so. But we don't write for those people unless you get with a writer that says we're writing for Ariana Grande. And then you go, oh, well, in that case, we've got some room to breathe. But keep in mind, we want our song to be singable by ourselves if we're an artist. So we don't want to, we don't want to, you know, hit a range that's over our ability. Um, but if we're pitching to someone else, we want to make sure that it's within their vocal range. So that's important. Singable is important. Um, let's see. Um, the other thing that it's going to have is, and we'll hear, we'll talk about this so much, is it's going to have casual, conversational approach to language, to the lyric. Casual, conversational approach, um, as opposed to, you know, like Shakespearean or, or early English uh, we're not going to go there unless you're writing Celtic music, of course. But we want, we always want our, we always want our lyric to sound as if it were, it was spontaneous. It sounds spontaneous, even though the listener kind of knows in the back of their mind that it probably was crafted over a long period of time, especially songs that are, you know, very, um, you know, uh, very uh, like like Sledgehammer probably took a long time to write because there's a lot of symbol symbolism going on. Uh, Love is a Rose, the, the Rose, um, that, you know, songs like that probably took a while to write. Um, I just heard that wonderful uh, song uh, that Winona sings uh, uh, about sailing from the harbor. Oh, God, what a great song. Uh, uh, Marcus Hummon and another great, great, great writer wrote that song. Uh, the, the name has just escaped me. At any rate, some songs take a long time to write, but you have the feeling that when you hear it, that it sounds, it sounds, it's easy to understand. It's in a simple syntax, so we don't reverse syntax. Like, from the harbor, I do sail. No, I sail from the harbor. You see how I'm not reverse. I'm not complicating things. So all great songs have a simple to understand conversational style of language, right? They also, all successful songs have, have a really good closure. To me, it's always easy to write the first verse and maybe even the chorus. But then we get what we call second verse-itis and we'll actually have a we're actually going to have a, a lesson on second verse itis come up later when we get to the end of all this basic stuff. All right. So we want all songs to have, you know, again, we want to keep that arc of interest rising, rising until the end. We don't want it to level off right here. You know, that's going to let them down. We want to keep it rising to the very end. All right? So we, we like, we, all, all successful songs have, a, have, a, have good closure. Have, so we keep in mind how we want this arc of interest to go. It's always important about how we're going to build this car so that all the components come together just right, right? So everything finishes just as it started, right? We want things to build, right? Um, another one of the great um, uh, basics of songwriting is what I call setting up expectations with all these tricks that we're going to give you, you know, uh, with all these elements. We set up an expectation. The minute I start a song, with my wonderful cutaway J45. You, I set up expectations, okay? 
And then I either give you what you expect or I give you a surprise. And I like to call the surprise happy surprise because it feels good. The surprise you go, ooh, love that. What we don't want? Huh? What? Was, what? No. You're out of here. See, we don't want that. So, you know, every time I start a song, got an expectation right there, right? You think I'm going to do it again, right? I don't mind telling you why I've got you under my thumb Now you're thinking, I'm going to go Then I heard you cry And I know that you're the now that's giving them what they expect. I could go, I made you cry, made it under the sun. You know why I can't believe you. See, I, I surprised you, didn't I? A little little beanie, beanie you know I, I i moved into the expectation and then i i gave you a little something different a little something different so a lot of songwriting is figuring out again in this magical moment of creativity magically figure out let's give them what they expect or let's give them a little surprise right both of those things have have the ability to keep listeners listening. Giving them what they expect, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'd like to hear that again, that's nice. Or you give them, what, what, what? Contrast, right? Giving them what they expect might be under the repetition. Musically, it was under the repetition, what I just did, right? Or I can musically give them a little bit of a new chord thrown in, and, uh, you know, just in my creative moment, it just felt right to go ahead and give him that new chord on the second line, right? Right? Just, it just, I don't know, just felt like that was something I needed to do right there. So you can decide to do that. And then later you go, you know, that didn't work. Let's just, let's keep it predictable. So da 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 now we change, right? Because um, when you set up a motive, the listener expects to hear a second one just like it. So when I go, the expectation is, okay, exactly the same. So you have a choice of, uh, I call it great expectations, right? So you as the songwriter have the power, you have the power to make these decisions, these wonderful, happy, interesting, creative decisions. I'm either going to give them what they want or I'm going to give them a surprise, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, another thing, uh, another basic, we're, we're trying to get all the basic stuff done today. Another basic concept of songwriting is the rule of one and the rule of one means one emotional message per song it's very very difficult to get two emotional messages and have it work when we try to do two emotional messages especially uh, young writers might try to do this what happens is you're watering down one of the messages you're you're sacrificing depth deep emotion to try to get to try to squeeze two in it's much better and much more successful monetarily to keep that one emotional message keep that interest rising 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 keep it interesting with the music with the chords with the rhyme scheme you know with all these things 
work on one thing. That's 90% of all songs deal with one universal emotional message. Okay? So that's just good to know. Um, another thing about, we're talking about ideas and titles. Um, a title or an idea, which sometimes is the same thing, an idea is only great, is only great. When is it great? Larry, I heard you say, and you're right, Larry, only after it's been proven. Oh. What do I mean by that? That means write all your songs. Write your small songs. Write your big songs. Write a song about your dog. That's a small song with a big emotion and a big heart. Of course, dogs. Who doesn't love dogs? Write a song about the destruction of Rome. World War II. A song about love always conquers everything. You can write your big songs. Write them all. Because you don't know when a song is great until you've played it for people and the people say, I don't like that song. Sorry. It's, you know, it's okay. Well, it was your big song. It was the big moment. You thought, you know, this song was, this, this was the, you know, you wrote a song about the, about the, uh, you know, the Chicago fire. Boom, boom, boom. But it just didn't, it didn't go. And then you wrote a song about your dog, you know, and that ended up being a huge song. It ended up being the title of a movie, a Disney movie called My Dog Red. And you just happened to write a song called My Dog Red. You just see what I mean? You don't know. So write all your songs. Write your big songs. Write your little songs. Write a song that you purposely think, this is going to be my wor the worst song I've ever written. I'm just going to write the worst song I've ever written. It's kind of a challenge to write a bad song just on purpose. You know, that could be a fun thing. And then you can always say, write the best song I've ever written. You know, you can do both of those things. It's, it's fun to take, take on these little challenges, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, topics. There's only three basic topics of songs when we talk about lyrics. Three basic topics. You've got songs about life. You've got songs about love. And you've got songs about God or spirituality or voodoo, whatever. That, that mystical thing that we call faith, right? Yeah. So we have songs about life, our real life, you know. Uh, I've got a, you know, I've got a truck. It's my only truck. It's a great truck, blah, blah, blah. Love. You know, you are the sunshine of my life, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then songs about spirituality, you know. Songs about love, gospel songs, uh, etc. There's only three. And it's interesting to note that love trumps life, right? So if you're talking about a life topic and you bring in a love interest and you bring it in a little too much, the song automatically turns into a love song, whether you want it to or not. It just that just happens because love conquers and is more interesting to a listener than life. It just is that people would just want to know, wait, 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 what happened to the girl that you talked about in the first verse? That that girl, that blonde that walked into the to the bar while you were playing pool and she when she winked at you and you winked back, and then you decided you and your boys went out and went to the drive-in after that. No, rewind, rewind. I want to know what happens to you and the girl, right? So, you know, you have to just be aware that love conquers and overpowers life topics, right? And also, the same thing with uh, spirituality. Once you start talking about God, the Bible, Jesus, Buddha, 
um, Muhammad, you know, suddenly the song becomes very quickly, with a, if, you, with you, if you mention it too much, very quickly a spiritual song. And you may not have wanted that, so you have to be careful. If you want to keep it secular, you can't mention too much about God, with rare exceptions. There are rare exceptions, right? God bless the broken road that, that has God in the theme. And um, there's a couple of other, especially country songs, that have God mentioned, and yet it still has a secular feel. They're tricky to write, okay? It's, that's what I call, that's advanced PI levels. You know, their levels are way high. They can get away with stuff that, that you and I, normal songwriters, have a hard time getting away with. But yeah, so that's a whole other thing. Okay, now, having said those three basic topics, there's also some subcategories, and that is topics of the home, mom and dad, your sister, your brother, your dog, your farm, uh, your city dwelling, um, your girlfriend, uh, your boyfriend's, you know, your home, meaning, you know, your, your, your bubble, you know, your, your family and friends, that kind of thing, right? There's the home, and then there's places, dates, objects, you know, like, like your, I could write a song about this, about this pink handkerchief, right? Or I could write a song about a date, like, you know, July 17, 1944. Uh, I could write, uh, that was my birthday. <laughs> Figure that one out. Um, so, you know, like a thing, an object, like a date. Also, colors. That's a thing. Colors are, are, all, are really proven, time-tested, proven uh, way to get a song started, right? So it can be a thing, an object, a date, a time, a color, right? Uh, you can even, you know, you can obviously you can have a person, you know? You can t write a song about one person, a thing. Um, there's also songs about um, jobs or hobbies, right? What do you do? So you can write about that. That's a time-tested uh, topic to write on. Then there's, of course, the old social commentary, right? Get on with yourself, you bad Bob Dylan, right? Get into it, you know, a John Lennon. You know, get your John Lennon on, you know? All these people that are famous for their social commentary, you know, give peace a chance, blah, blah. Yeah. So social commentary songs. Then there's songs spiritual. Songs about the way you feel about the, the ether, the way you feel about faith, the things that you can't see, that seem to guide your life in some way. And you can talk about those things. Those are time-tested topics. And last but not least is we have um, travel, where the song takes place over a series of, you know, like six days on the road. That's a time-tested topic, right? Again, all these things, all these topics, you can either go high or you can go low. You can go happy or sad. You can go love or hate, right? On all these topics, right? So that's just a good thing to know, right? Um, let's see. Oh, when we talk about, when we talk about titles, um, you might want to know where where do, where do titles go in a song? Where where do you put a title anyway? Well, the answer is complicated, uh, and we'll get more into it when we talk about song development. We get very much into where titles go, right? But just for the time being, I will mention that titles. When you're talking about chorus songs, titles are can be at the beginning of the chorus, at the end of the chorus, both, or it can be spread out all through the chorus, right? So you can do those th three ways for, for a chorus song, for a non-chorus song. And again, if you don't know what a non-chorus song is, 
Take the song Yesterday by the Beatles. Most people know that song, uh, at least, in, you know, maybe, you know, maybe the teenagers today never heard Yesterday. Uh, Non-chorus songs aren't popular today. You know, they're, so you don't hear them very often, but they're, but they're one of the greatest formats that music can be in, that songwriting can be in, so we're going to talk about that. But in a non-chorus song, the title can be at the beginning of the verse and or the end of the verse or de equally th throughout the verse. Those are the three ways it can, co it can come up, three ways. <laughs> My finger's stuck free. All right? So that, that's where a title can be, right? Um, I, I have this thing called the title test, which is just a little something to keep redundancy at bay. And, we'll, and the title test is, the title should mean more every time you hear it, right? So every time you hear the title, unless it's just being repeated, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love Well, obviously, it's not going to mean more than that. But every time it comes up in the song, it should mean more. If it doesn't mean more, that means you're being redundant. And you need to go back and, and fix the lyric to where it says something new and different than what you've already said. All right? So the title test. The title should mean more every time you hear it. Right? Just a nice little reminder of things. Right? Um... Uh, and I think that's going to kind of wrap up the basics, right? From here, we get into the nuts and bolts of form, development, rhyme, rhythm, and um, melodies, chords, and textures. We're going to go through all those things, right? And, and lyric elements, right? So uh, uh, I'm going to sign off for now. And uh, I will see you on Friday at 11, and we'll continue this basic songwriting course, which I'm calling uh, Wiki Songwriter, right? It's just the encyclopedia of what songs are. We're breaking down the components of songs so you can go out and use all these components to better your songs, right? Am I right? You know I'm right. I'm always right. All right, so until next time, until Friday, um, keep her on the double nickel. I'll see you on the flip-flop. Adios, amigos. Love you guys. Love